Mr. Wallace. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, wait a minute. I went through my whole spiel and nobody heard it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, uh, I was wondering what was going on. I said maybe because I'm backstage, I can't hear it, but yeah. Damn, I went through my whole, you know, talking all my crap, my opening uh, uh, monologue. But uh, anyway, um, thank you for coming, Dr. Wallace. Uh, I came across a piece of your work the other day, and, and I found it very interesting because um, I've heard of you before. Um, I believe my wife watches you on Facebook, so she's a fan of yours. But I looked into... Um, the piece of work you had talking about uh, incest, molestation, and rape inside the African-American community. And I believe you published that in 2016, right? Mm -hmm. I believe. Right. And we talk about it often here on this side of media. And the reason why I wanted you to come tonight, because, you know, we, we wanted to have a professional insight on this thing. And me personally maybe it's just me i think that many of the things that ail black people i think this whole uh, uh incest and inbreeding and molestation i think it is part of it am i wrong to think that uh not at all i think that one of the problems that we have as a collective uh, as a race and then as a society as a whole is that we isolate behaviors without understanding the conglomerate influence of experiences. Um, when it comes to childhood uh, experiences such as uh, physical abuse, neglect, uh, sexual abuse, incest, and, and, and things like that, they're also classified on a grand scale as what is known as ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And these uh, adverse childhood experiences, each adverse childhood experiences, there are 10 uh, primary that are recognized by most uh, uh, clinical professionals, uh, researchers or those who study it. And they range from uh, any type of abuse from physical, emotional, uh, sexual abuse, uh, parents divorcing, uh, parents becoming incarcerated, parents being addicted uh, to a chemical substance. Um, and what in each one of those instances is considered an ACE point. All you need is four ACE points, and then you're in a catastrophic path to uh, a lifetime of different issues just in health alone. Uh, a child that is that that has four aces is 12 times more likely to attempt suicide. They are four times more likely to develop diabetes, heart disease, ischemic heart disease, uh, and a number of other different uh, physical illnesses. So, and this carries out over the course of a lifetime. And so you have to understand that just in that sense alone, you're talking about something catastrophic. But when you're talking about something as serious as uh, sexual abuse, molestation and incest. Now you're talking about a traumatic injury. And with that traumatic injury comes what we call a traumatic memory. And that traumatic memory is what keeps driving the uh, the reliving of the experience. And uh, in, in, in essence, when you become traumatized. Now, experiencing a traumatic event doesn't automatically mean that you're going to be traumatized by it. And there are a number of different factors, too many to get into, that can impact that. Uh, but what happens is when you uh, are traumatized, uh, it's an interruption of the natural linear process of your timeline. So what happens when a normal uh, event takes place is you have an event, you categorize it, you catalog it in your mind, and it goes down as a memory. Whenever you recall that event, it comes in as a memory, but it also is categorized automatically by the brain and the mind as something that happens in the past. Uh, when you come to a traumatic event that traumatizes you, when it comes up, it actually comes up as a reactment of or a reliving of. And so you literally re-experience it as if it were happening now. And it comes with a number of different behaviors. Um, 
uh, hypervigilance, fear of a foreshortened death, uh, and a number of other different uh, behaviors that make it extremely difficult to operate effectively in a social environment. So, I mean, I've read the, I, I've read the percentages, you know, I've read the stats on, you know, child molestation. Cause like I said, you know, we talk about it a lot over here. And I think that a lot of us, I, I don't want to say that, that it causes uh, most of the people, most of the people that it happens to, I don't want to say that it, it causes adverse effects on them, you know, make them drug addicts, make them more likely to go to jail and all that kind of stuff. But that does play a part in it, right? I mean, uh, uh, the promiscuity, you know, uh, bad well, habits, bad decision making, all that kind of stuff, right? Right. Well, let's narrow down the, the primary issue to that of a sexual nature. So we're going to say uh, rape, molestation, and incest. Um, and we're going to say primarily minors. So uh, probably about 20 years ago uh, in my in my practice, I'm working uh, with clients. And over the course of about 18 months, I noticed a pattern that I hadn't picked up on before, but it was there once I went back and I researched, but I hadn't really picked up on it. Uh, I guess I was becoming more in tune with what was going on with our people. And so I paid maybe a little bit more attention to the patterns that I was seeing. The pattern that I noticed was that at a very high rate, um, at a very high rate, uh, the females that were coming to me, black females, were after going through the process. Normally, when I work with someone, we don't just go dive in. We have to develop a level of trust because where we're going is going to be uh, pretty scary. If you've dealt with some trauma in the past and I sense you dealt with trauma, then we do what I call uh, we peel layers. We start with where you're at and we slowly go backwards. And in the process of doing that, we eventually get back to the cause of everything else that you're doing. We get to the cause because without getting to the cause, you cannot. Uh, without getting to the cause, you cannot have the cure. You cannot heal. Uh, you can hide symptoms. You can suppress symptoms. But the goal is to uh, heal and become whole again. And so when we get back, what I found is a, a, uh, a high number, I mean, I'm talking about 80% or higher of the females that were coming to me, black females that were coming to me, had some form of uh, sexual trauma as a minor, meaning before the age of 18, they had experienced some force uh, sexual trauma uh, by someone in their family, a friend or someone uh, that they knew. Um, and so I went to a colleague of mine and asked him a question. I said, man, either we got a problem that we are not acknowledging or I've got to be the most unlucky therapist on the planet because I'm getting an extremely high number of black women who've been molested or in some way sexually uh, violated as a child. He said, he told me, no, it's not just you. So then I started looking into it. And it wasn't at the time, it wasn't a whole lot of research that focused on that. So you had to kind of be very, very diligent in in uh, acquiring the numbers to sort of validate this idea that you're having. And now there's more and more. The empirical data is starting to accumulate on, on, on this particular issue and what's in it. But what 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 we found is uh, on a very liberal on a very liberal uh, perspective, we're talking 60 percent. To 62% of black women have been in some way sexually violated before their 18th birthday. In the most conservative numbers, we're talking 40%. Mm. So anywhere we go, we're talking about an extremely large number of black women who have been violated in some way or another sexually. And that comes with it a number of different responses. Not everyone reacts to this type of uh, violation or or in physical infraction in the same way. Uh, some will become promiscuous um, and uh, will develop an inability uh, to control their sexual urges. Others will become, uh, be found on the extreme polar end of that pole where they don't trust anyone and they don't wanna have sex, they hate sex. Uh, it, it makes them feel dirty. Others will seek 
an escape route uh, with alcoholism or uh, some form of uh, drug that will allow them to literally check out for large periods of time. And some will become extremely hostile. Others will develop certain mental um, uh, psychosis. Um, you know, and, and, and all of this can be um, attributed to what happened to them as a child. Uh, obviously, there are all other variables that you have to take into consideration over time. But when you have a large group, and in that large group, you have uh, what you call a cluster of certain behaviors, and it's common among the group, then you have to say there's some direct linkage to the commonality that the group has. And in this instance, it's uh, sex being sexually violated as a child. So yeah, definitely. When you start seeing that, you have to look at it. it and, and what you find is a lot of times, even when there isn't initially a um, uh, an admission or a report of something happening, it's a lot of times because the memory has been suppressed. And then it takes, again, a lot of work of peeling back and getting there to actually realize, yes, it did happen. So it it, it runs deep and it, 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 it's an issue that we can definitely call an elephant in the room because we haven't done a very good job of addressing it. Yeah, I notice in your work, you speak of the, the, uh, the silence, um, the unwillingness to, to say anything. I mean, why do you think that is? I mean, why is it that we know this stuff is going on? We know this stuff is happening to, to children. We know it. All right. It's not like we don't know it. Why the reluctance to say anything? When we know that saying something could stop it, I mean, why? Why do you think there's such a reluctance in in the adults? Forget the kids. You know, the, the children are probably afraid, but I'm talking right. about the adults. Why? Why do we always have this constant cycle of adults who just won't say anything or are in flat denial that it's even happening at all? Well. I think first you have to look at the historical context uh, from which this emerges. And in the in historical context, what you have traditionally before the 1960s is you have a situation in which uh, the, the male in the home is the primary provider or the sole provider. Uh, you remove him from the home and there's immediate financial strain. He's also the protector, quote unquote, protector of the home, not doing a very good job if he's the violator. But sometimes he's not. Sometimes it's somebody else in the home. Uh, a lot of the issues that I found wasn't the father. It was the brother. It was the cousin. It was the uncle. It was the friend of the father. Um, and so it's it's a number of different ways it happens. But sometimes it, it, the ancestral uh, relationships are the father. Uh, and I've seen a number of those. But when you go back, what you have is a situation you've got what I it's what I call it, what I call it is silent condemnation. What silent condemnation is, you have two forms of condemnation when you condone a, a, a behavior. The first one is you outwardly or overtly condone it. You literally like, hey, that's cool. You know, that's what you want to do. You do it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you won't get that in a primary sense in this type of situation, you get what's known as silent condemnation. Silent condemnation is simply condoning it by not speaking out, by not doing something to stop it. You are in, 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 in essence condoning it. The moment that someone that, that's doing it knows you know, and you're not gonna do anything about it. You just condone their behavior, right or wrong. And the problem with it was, it was this natural, uh, behavior that can be traced back to slavery of the black woman to protect the black man because the black man was the primary target and the attacks on the black man by slave uh by slave owners by uh uh the overseers and uh what a lot of people don't realize is the most feared person on the plantation wasn't the 
the white male slave owner or the overseer it was the mistress of the uh of the plantation um and and that came in a lot of different ways and and her wrath was severe and it often ended in severe punishment or even death and so uh there were ways that black women would literally go out of their ways to be the buffer in in in, in between uh the hostility and the black man that carried on into uh the emancipation stage where we are now out there and we're still going through a very hostile stage you got to remember we went we went right from being slaves right into reconstruction where the south was rebuilding itself and reestablishing its antebellum roots after uh the clandestine groups like the clan pushed the military installments from the north out so it left us uh two million slaves down here with no car no no protection for 12 years uh, which was reconstruction. Then we had the black codes. We had convict leasing. We had sharecropping. We had uh, almost 70 years of Jim Crow segregation where it was literally uh, nobody was doing anything. You could lynch a black man in, in public, have a picnic, and it was, you know, what, the, what wasn't anything going to happen. Uh, and so there was this need or this, this, this natural urge for black women. And then also, uh, the church played a major role in this and the church doesn't like to deal with it and uh but the church played a major role there is countless uh instances in which pastors have advised wives not to report their husbands because it would pull them out of the home um there are countless times where the person who was molested uh became the black sheep in the family became the person who was the outcast, ostracized by the family, looked at as the enemy because the family secrets rested in them and they they were ready to uh, open up and uh, express themselves and release those secrets. And they became the enemy and they, they uh, either had to break away from the family or they had to operate in extreme hostility. Uh, but to basically answer the question, you're talking about a situation where there's a natural uh proclivity to protect the provider as well as the inherent nature of black women to cover black men and keep them out of harm's way when possible and then uh the leadership of the black community which is black clergy uh in many instances were protecting uh black men for whatever reason and so the combination of that led to a lot of situations in which it just was not brought to the surface there were times that the community knew it was obvious you know i can remember back i was a, a 60s baby and i grew up in the 70s and uh finished high school in the 80s and i can tell you there was more than one instance where there were people in our neighborhood that everybody knew that he was having that that his daughter's child was his that your grandson is also your son or your granddaughter is also your uh daughter um and that was known in the neighborhood and you know while people would whisper nobody was doing anything about it and like i said this is the 60s and 70s primarily and so uh it's been a problem for a while yeah well do you think that this that this is still going on today in 2022 and it and is it for those same reasons are these people who are doing this are they still being protected by by these women are they still being protected by you know clergy and 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 people at the church is that do you think that that's still going on to this day right now i don't have the empirical data to back up uh my claim but i know that i can tell you i know it's going on i can't tell you that i know it's going on at the rate that it was 40 years ago but I can tell you it's going on. I can tell you it's going on because uh, I have connections to CPS. So I know mm -hmm. children are being pulled from the home for that very reason. Uh, not that uh, being put in foster care is a better situation because foster care is feeding human trafficking rings. So you've got all of these different things that are going on. But yes, it's, it's definitely going on. Um, a lot of these child murders where you're seeing the child being murdered by... Um, uh, 
stepfathers or boyfriends or whatever, and mothers are covering it up. Uh, a lot of times those of those murders are because the child is coming of age and able to talk and they are concerned about it and it comes out in various ways but it's definitely still happening um we the the, the frightening thing about it is because it's so underreported that we won't really get the statistics about what's happening now until the people who are being victimized are of age and able to report it are able to uh uh, talk about it in, in in therapeutic sessions. And we still won't know the truth because there will be so many that will never, ever come forth. Well, I, I want to ask you about this because I think that when it comes to us as a people, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of us out there. Um, we don't know who our father is. There's a lot of us out there who our fathers don't have anything to do with us. I think a lot of this stuff would halt. I don't know if it would totally go away, but it's kind of hard to violate a child when a child is under the protection of his father. Um, I think a lot of these children are unprotected. Um, I think the I think black children are the most unprotected people around. I truly believe that. And and I think we got to do more to protect these children. I, I think we got to do a little more to stop this from happening. And, and when we hear about it the first time, we make that the last time. Because, I, um, you know, just reading your work, you know, when this stuff happens to a kid, man, this is one of the worst things that can happen to a child, man. And it'll affect them all throughout their whole life. I've had many people on this very stream, on this very program, who have come and, and talked about it and discussed it and talked about how, you know, their mother just ignored her boyfriend doing this, that, and the other thing to them, you know, just, and, and you can hear it in their voices, doctor, that it still affects them today. And these people are in their thirties and forties, you know, they're not even in their twenties. I mean, these are middle I have, people. I have clients. I have two clients right now still struggling with this and they're in their 60s wow so that, that 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 speaks to the severity of it and i think that you do have a very valid point when you talk about the fact that our kids are unprotected yeah uh the, the truth of the matter is there is data out there uh pragmatic and empirical uh data that's out there that points to the fact that a child that is not in the house with his biological his or her biological father is uh, three to four times more likely to be abused, not just sexually, but physically abused. Um, and normally it's going to be by the mom's new partner. And so uh, that's a reality. Um, that's an issue that we need to confront and how can we deal with this? And you understand when you talk about this, uh, like I said, th there's information out there that says, in 1960, we were talking about 75% uh, of Black children were born into two-parent households with the biological father being in the house. We're almost the reverse of that now. We're almost at 72, 73% born into single-parent households where the biological father is not in the house. And so uh, with that being said, uh, there's not the natural environment of protection. Uh, there's not the natural uh, mechanism of covering of a physical, emotional, and even spiritual covering that a father is supposed to provide in the home that's absent. Um, there is a lot of issues that, uh, that we have to address as to why uh, women will allow men to come in and do that because a person who is whole and healed would not. Uh, this isn't about applying excuses. This is about understanding that if you're going to fix the problem, you've got to acknowledge all the elements and the components of the problem. Uh, and finger pointing does absolutely nothing to fix it. It feels good to go out and say, you did this, you did that, and you know, throw some adjectives out there that we can't say right now. And, 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 and it feels good, but it, it's done nothing to change it. So then you have to study and you have to invest in understanding the behavior 
and where the behavior comes from. You know, it's not natural to 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 do that. It's not natural to behave in a number of different ways we do. So then you have to ask yourself, where's the behavior coming from? And we tend to be very critical of ourselves. So when someone starts talking about, well, they're doing this because of this, we don't want to hear it because they shouldn't be doing it, but blah, blah, blah. But the problem is, no, they shouldn't be. And after a certain age, no matter what's happened to you as a child, it's going to be ultimately your responsibility to fix it because I'm almost guaranteeing you the person that did it to you is not going to fix it. So it's up to you. But we still have to give consideration to why you are where you are. Well, I want to jump into another N word because we're doing the N words tonight. Mm -hmm. And this one is inbreeding. Do you do you think that there is a risk of inbreeding throughout black society? And I and I'll tell you why why I bring that up. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a lot of kids out there who don't if you don't know who your father is, right? You have no idea who your father is. Anybody out there that you meet can potentially be a sister, a brother, a cousin, a aunt, or whatever, because you don't know who your father is. Therefore, you don't know what other kids he has, his sisters, his whatever. So anybody out there could be potentially related to you. If you don't know who your father is. So mm -hmm. do we run a risk of inbreeding because of that? Because of the, the 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 small percentage of men out there who may have 10, 15 baby mamas and they got kids that they don't know about. Is that kid at risk when he goes out to look for a mate? He looking for a girlfriend or a woman looking for a boyfriend. Is that a risk? Is that? Is that a thing that we should be concerned with? Um, as crazy as it may sound, absolutely. Um, and it's not as far-fetched when you take into consideration the complete dynamic as it may sound on the surface to some of us. No, actually, uh, it, it can happen. Um, and you have to be aware of how it happens. Number one is what you said is going to be a problem. Because if I'm procreating and I'm spreading my seeds, there are a couple of things that happens. I'm spreading my seeds and there are multiple uh, women who are having my kids. Uh, then they may not all know each other. And they may not all bring their, their children together to create sibling bonds. So the kids may not know each other. This that's the first thing that we're talking about is where the siblings don't know each other. They are out there. They're siblings and they don't know each other. It could easily be me because I never met my dad, but my dad, you know, procreated. Uh, I just had the first word. I'm 54 years old. I just had uh, the first conversation with my, my uh, uh, one of my younger brothers uh, who I hadn't met for, you know, until recently. I mean, like a couple of years ago, I just had my first conversation with him. I knew he existed. I had heard about him but if i saw him in a crowd i wouldn't know i've got a sister in atlanta i still haven't met i know she's out there but i never met her if i ran across i wouldn't know her um and this is just my family and my situation with my dad but it happens so the idea that you could you know by chance run across someone um that that that's a possibility uh how probable it is to happen on a grand scale probably not a whole lot here's the problem the bigger problem with inbreeding is when you don't have children who are around each other on a regular basis when they're growing up, they're born in different houses, reared by different parents. And even if the father eventually brings them together, there's no sibling bond. They don't see each other as siblings in that sense. Now, they might say, this is my sister, this is my brother, blah, blah, blah. But there's a bond that you develop when you're coming up that you develop this and that when you go through sexual maturity, you don't have a sexual attraction to your siblings. No matter how attractive everybody else thinks they are, they're your siblings. That doesn't take place if you're not reared in the same house. So now you come around each other 
and you're trying to keep this sibling thing going, but you're looking over there going, man, she sure looking good. And she looking at you and going, whatever. Y'all hanging out one night, y'all go out friends, y'all chilling at the house. And it pops off. I know of several that have literally, uh, what's funny, I know of one that actually were married before they found out they were siblings. I know another two that knew they were siblings, have, have siblings. Uh, well, you know, in the black community, we don't do too much of the half stuff. If you were born by the same mom, yeah, you know, you, your brother and sister, no matter who your daddy was, that's that's just the way I was reared. Um, but um, so you have these probabilities, and that second one is more likely to happen. One where you know that's your sibling, but you don't have a sibling bond with them, wow. and that's a reality, and it does happen, and it's a problem. And so can inbreeding be an issue? Yes. And so, so go ahead, Doc. No, go ahead. No, what I was going to say was, so if you have these, uh, these inbreeding situations and kids are coming out of said situations, now we have a new problem, right? Because inbreeding comes with problems too, right? right. I mean, you know, uh, you, you're talking all kinds of problems from inbreeding. Right. Genetic problems, uh, mental problems, uh, performance problems, and a bunch of other things that comes out. And then there is, again, I have so many clients that I deal with on this. This is why you saw that report. It's also in, in my book, Born in Captivity, Psychopathology as a Legacy of Slavery. Uh, I talk about it in there as well. Uh, I talk about it in the undoing of the African-American mind. But what, what, what you get is this. I've got a number of clients that are the products of incest. Mm. And the moment they find out your uncle is your daddy or your granddaddy is your daddy or whatever situation, that's an entire new trauma and psychological issue they have to work through they'll start acting out they'll become withdrawn they uh you know will take on a number of different risky or what we would call risque behaviors that put them in jeopardy just all different types of uh behaviors that are not what we would call pro-social So what you're what you're saying, Doc, is that were they quote unquote normal before they found out, and then once they found out that grandpa was also their daddy, that's when they start to act out a little more. On the psychological side, behavioral issues, yes. Uh, when you start talking about congenital uh, effects based on genetics. Uh, you know, where you're talking about birth defects and things of that nature, that's going to be from birth. Mm. Um, some will be uh, more pronounced, some will be less pronounced, but those things will happen at birth. There will be times when a person will know they have a congenital, congenital effect and they won't know why until later in life when they find out based on some medical emergency or based on some situation where blood tests have to be taken. And now you're realizing, wait a minute, you know, and um, it in how uh, it is revealed is equally uh, important. You know, most of the times it's not revealed in a structured uh, environment where the environment has been developed and uh, more conducive to uh, not being as disrupted. Normally, it's found out by way of a violent release of a secret by someone angry. You know, somebody gets mad at somebody else and say, you need to ask him who your daddy is. Or you need to ask her who your real daddy is. Or, you know, and there you go. Now you have this traumatic event that takes place and you found out something of that significance in a very, you know, emotionally violent way. And so uh, that's just one thing. And so it's it's like it's so many different layers to the way a person can be damaged out of this, that it'll, it'll blow your mind. I mean, 
you number one is if you are a part of the problem if you are the person that's being molested that's the experience then you go through the traumatic experience of having it shoved back down your throat because nobody will believe you then you have somebody threatening you that if you tell the truth i'm going to kill everybody in the house and then you've got all of this stuff you're carrying so you shut up you mind your business you take it you grow up and then the whole family doesn't believe you when you come out and you want to talk about it yeah so it is immensely important that we start to address this at a core level and it's so and the problem is that it's so pervasive especially if you're talking about people over 30 it's so pervasive that you're going to have a hard time getting to the root of it because it's going to have it's going to be you're going to be stepping on toes right you right when you go off into the community you start sitting up saying we need to build these type of programs we need to develop these type of programs you're going to be stepping on some shoes because it's going to be some people that are perpetuating these behaviors and they don't want that in their house they don't want oversight they don't want accountability they don't want the therapy nobody wants anybody to get therapy if it's that type of behavior that's going on in the house because those secrets come out in therapy oh yeah you know and what happens is the person who you've been able to manipulate and suppress starts to feel strength and starts to gain a sense of courage and now they want to confront the situation and it's not it's not going to bode well for you uh and so there's all this pushback and so now what we're dealing with is a community that doesn't want to confront its issue because it's going to land on a bunch of doorsteps yeah and we are we are secretive people um because of for instance i mean you know uh, uh somebody was touching on kids 15 20 years ago and he still gets invited to thanksgiving dinner he still gets invited to the family reunion and you know he's walking around there pretending like nothing ever happened and guess what not only are the parents of those kids walking around there pretending like nothing happened even the people who endured it 15 20 years ago they're walking around there pretending yeah. like nothing ever happened yeah. so you got just yeah. a bunch of people walking around pretending at the thing at thanksgiving dinner right he the uh the 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 the, the the trend and tendency in this is that the perpetrator is the most protected person in the family uh, everybody else is basically bending around his existence uh and sometimes it's her and i think we need to you know be honest about how many women literally are violating children uh oh yeah and, and 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 so we we don't need to make it just be a man thing this is a issue an issue where both male and females are violating children sexually okay so here's the thing though you got this dude who everybody in the family knows you know why everybody in the family knows because once upon a time somebody saw some children hanging around that hadn't been violated yet and they said hey you need to get your children mm -hmm. They didn't have to say anything else because when somebody said you need to get them children from around uh rob or john or whoever it is everybody knows what that means and so now you could be at the family reunion like you said everybody's pretending nothing's wrong until them kids get close to it yeah and then somebody's saying you, you need to get them kids and that's the only time that it's ever even brought up and everybody just knows get the kids you know the fact that he's still invited I mean, the fact that he's still breathing, as far as I'm con I'm concerned, yeah, <laughs> is, is, a, is a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. Uh, see, my my whole thing is, I have a real simple minded thing. I th I tell people all the time, uh, there's this idea and this 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 notion of uh, moral superiority, and everybody claims to have it. You know, white people want to pretend they are morally superior to everybody else. Black people want to believe because we've been through everything, we're morally superior. And I think on a spiritual level, we have a more in, uh, uh, we have a more empathetic uh, perspective and approach to things. So we tend to care more. So we treat people nicer as a general rule. But I tell people all the time, it's not morality that keeps people from misbehaving. It's consequence. 
the vast majority of people do what they do in this world because they don't like the consequences of doing something different. There are a bunch of people that'd be dead right now if the person that didn't like them wasn't afraid of prison. Mm -hmm. And that's just the reality. I use the extreme there, but that's the reality. And the same thing, until you put a consequence that's so undesirable with a behavior that you don't like, you will continue to have to endure the behavior. If you sit up and say you get caught messing with a kid, it's immediate death. You will never make it to the jail. The system yeah. won't, won't, won't get to try you. We're going to put you down. If you made that clear, that violating, and to me, it's not just children, it's women. Violating a woman or violating a child is immediate death. Period. I guarantee you. There are some sick people who are still trying, because some, some people are just, I mean, sick to a level, absolutely no way they can control it. Others are just predators. And the bottom line is, are you willing to risk your life to hunt? Because that's what you're yeah. doing. You, you're praying on the weak. You're praying on the vulnerable. You're praying on those who can't defend themselves, who can't get away from you. But you, you're a predator. You know, but the, the thing is, what we as black men have to do, you know, and this is me taking off the scientific hat and me putting on the father hat. What black we as black men have to do is show these predators that they aren't the apex predator in the community, that the dad willing to die for his family is the apex predator because he's killing anything that becomes a threat. And, and, and that now here's the crazy thing. And, and, and I'll say this and I'll turn it back over to you. Here's the crazy thing. The moment that we take that mindset with this one thing, it will naturally become an instinctive behavior with other things, which means people coming outside from outside the community in the community to cause harm would also understand these people don't play. If you come in here and kill one of my sons, you're not leaving. Now, you might y'all might get me, but you're not leaving. If you come in here and wrongfully harm somebody in this community, you're not leaving. Period. That consequence sends a message. Do I really want to go in there and do that? Is it really worth it? But when there are no consequences, the boldness of that behavior extends itself. At some point, we have to stand up and say, not on my watch. Man, one of the things that I saw back in 80, in 80, so I want to say 83, 84, um, that's back when, you know, I was living, I was reared by my great grandparents, by the way. So I was reared by my grandmother's parents. So I got some, I got a big age gap, generational gap in the house, but my grandparents watched the six of five 30 and six o'clock news religiously. So you, if you was in the house, you was watching the news at that time, man. And I remember that was, I want to say in San Francisco, I can't remember where, I want to say in San Francisco, I could be wrong, but a little girl had been kidnapped, a little white girl had been kidnapped by a white guy, taken away and sexually molested. They found him. He had, he still had her. They found him, got the little girl back, and they were finally got him extradited and they were bringing him back in through the airport. The father knew about it. He sit there and waited. He was on the phone with a friend. And, and he told the friend, in a, in a second, you're about to hear a pop. When they got by him, he said, oh, I got to go. He dropped the phone, turned around, and popped him right in the head. Mm. He didn't do no time for it. Wow. He didn't do any time for it. I forget exactly how it was eventually adjudicated, but he didn't do any time for it. I'm not saying that's going to be the outcome for us, but sometimes you got to be willing to sacrifice something in, or, in order to fight for something. And I think that is a part of our problem across the board is we want a lot, but we're not really ready to go the distance to have it. Yeah. And and don't people count on that? I mean, oh, yeah. you know, forget the part that they're this deviant, freaking miscreant person. They don't see the consequence. There's pretty much a lack of consequence because they can count on the mother not saying anything. They can count on it being kept quiet. They can count on the kid 
not saying too much and nobody believes them. So, you know, when you have these lack of consequences, you make it easy. You make it really, really easy for people who have these, you know, deviant minds. You make it easy for them to go right ahead and march right through because there is no foreseeable consequences at the end of the act, right? Right. So maybe, just maybe, we might, I don't know, a, a few of us may have to go ahead and sacrifice our freedom and our lives to, uh, you know, make it so some of these guys don't exist anymore to set a precedent and maybe, just maybe, we can get a handle on this stuff once they figure out that people are willing to die and kill over this. So... I, I, I agree with that. I think that, you know, obviously uh, the love I have, I have for my people is, you know, at the forefront. So the last thing I want to see is the loss of life. But I think that the, the, the number one call of a man is to protect, you know, we've been commodified in this country so much that everyone judges us by our money. And I think that a man needs to be a provider. I think that he needs to be a financial covering but I don't think that he needs to be undervalued if he can't do the whole load. Uh, some of us are blessed enough that we we can. Some of us are not. But it, are we out there busting our ass to do it is the question. But more importantly, before a man is a provider, and I tell people all the time, and I think it's important uh, to understand this. I tell people all the time that before a man is a provider, he's a protector first. And the, being a protector is the one thing that can never be taken away from him, as long as he's physically healthy. Uh, you can be the best provider in the world and something can go wrong. And for a while, you won't be uh, providing the way you used to. You can, your, your business can go bankrupt. Your job can lay you off. Uh, you can come down with an illness. But as long as you're healthy, you can stand up and tell the world, everybody behind me belongs to me. And you got to go through me to get to them. And I'm willing to go all out to stop you. And that's something that a man can do no matter how many dollars or dimes are in his pocket. He can sit up and say, you're not gonna harm anybody in my house or I'm gonna harm you. And that, so the man is the protector before he's the provider. Now he, he needs to work on being able to provide, but I think that uh, in the provider spectrum or the provider discussion, I think black men and black women need to be talking more about building together than talking about who can pay all the bills. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. I, 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 you know, I think that if you can do it, but I think there has to be a plan on building because when you build together, you're stronger because if it's all one person and something happens to that person. Yeah. You know, that's how we got to the, if you remember, that's how we got here in the first place with this whole sexual abuse thing. We can't tell on him because he's the provider. Yeah. Well, if we built something and I'm just as solid as you are, then I'm going to hold you accountable. And it's it's so many things that go off into that. Um, and the crazy thing is, because we are producing a situation from the 50s and the 60s, of, of all these events that took place in the 70s and in, in, in the 80s as well. Now you got these situations. Now you got other issues that are compounded because of the lack of healing, the lack of proper intervention. So now it's not just this happening. Now they're out doing things and you wonder why they why are they acting that way? And then guess what? They go out and procreate and have children. And those children are born into dysfunctional, toxic environments. And we're going to expect them to be productive and strong and, and pro-social in their behaviors? No, it's going to consistently get worse until you start to deal with the source or the cause. Yeah, because how can we expect people who were raised in a, I don't know, a dysfunctional, maddening, insufferable environment um, they're not going to be a child forever. Eventually, they're going to grow up and become an adult. And now you got this person who was raised in this crazy environment. Now this person has kids. So all they know is crazy, right? Yeah. So how how can we expect them to teach their children different when all they know is crazy? So 
I mean, we have to kind of stop it at somewhere, but where do we stop it, Doc? I mean, where, how do we stop it, Doc? What are, what are we supposed to do? I mean, there's no simple answer for this. Uh, I have gone to great lengths to put together what I call the Blueprint 1.0, uh, which is this restrengthening of the Black community. And it's going to require a conglomerate effort uh, in the areas of economics, in the areas of education, in the areas of reestablishing the black family. You cannot see one people what they don't what, what people don't realize. I'm gonna say this, and then I, I'm not gonna be able to stay too much longer. But, yeah, I know I only got you for an hour, so I'm trying to get it all in. Go ahead, Doc. Right, got you. right. But um, you know what happens is if you go back and you look and you see what happened is. Uh, the beginning of slavery. So when we're talking about the transatlantic slave trade, where you actually have people who are being brought over from Africa, they weren't born here, they were brought over. Okay, they're brought over in shackles and they are kept in shackles, but there's a process that takes place. And if you follow the history of slavery, not just in its most brutal form, which was chattel slavery in the West, but slavery and period. The way that people were enslaved were not with shackles, it was with their mind. It was with the uh, usurpation of their whole identity. So what happens is when they're brought over here, uh, what happens is there's a slow process of usurping their mind. And the way they do that is you, they're robbed. We, we were robbed of our values, our interests, and our principles. We were robbed of the very uh, structure through which the values and the interests and principles were perpetuated. That's the family. When you interrupt the family, you interrupt the perpetuation of a system of values being perpetuated down the generational line of the uh, lineage. So in essence, uh, you have four basic institutions in the world. Uh, the first is the individual. The individual functions as his own institution because it makes decisions, it develops ideas. He can do everything, she can do everything as an individual. The next institution is the marriage. The marriage is the foundation for the family, which is the third institution. And the fourth institution in general is whatever government or uh, political entity controls it, whether it's the village elders or it's an actual federal government or whatever. That's the fourth institution. That second institution is extremely important because what happens is you get two individuals, two institutions that come together and decide to become one institution. And when it was done, when it's done right, when it's done the way it's historically been done before it became corrupted in the West, it is two people that's coming from two families with similar value systems, similar ideas about how life is supposed to be lived, how a man treats a woman, how a woman treats a man, how uh, important building and owning businesses is. All of this stuff is developed as a system, systemic force in both families. So they decide, okay, we're going to get married because we have similar value systems. Now we're going to take these similar value systems. These values serve our interests and these interests uh, protect and perpetuate it in our principles and how we live our lives. But the values are what we are going to enforce. So the children are brought up and you know, we're going to read uh, a book a week. We're going to we're going to go places. We're going to travel. We're going to study. We're going to know who we are. Uh, one of the things I did with all of my daughters, I have eight. One of the things I did with, with my daughters, and I still do, um, is even with the older ones, is when they were real little, my oldest daughter is 36. And when she was... Uh, a little girl, she's walking around and I, when she began to be able to talk and hold conversations, I said, come here. No matter how many times I came across her in the house, he said, come here. Who's the most beautiful girl in the world? I am, daddy. What can you do if you put your mind to it? The sky's the limit. I can do anything I want. Okay. And that's like constantly. She's bombarded with that. If I see her five times, 10 times a day, she's going to be asked, who's the most beautiful girl in the world? Well, I've established a couple of things. I've told her something about herself that every woman wants to hear. Before she even knows she wants to hear, she hears it because it imme immediately makes her life. She doesn't even know what beautiful is the first time she heard it, but it made her smile. Okay, so now she's hearing it, but she's hearing it at such a rate and from a person who has the most influential force in her life, her father. So no other guy is going to be able to come, on and tell her, come along and tell her she's beautiful and blow her mind. 
because she's been she by the time he comes along she's heard it a million times i know i'm beautiful what else she got then i'm telling her she can do anything so i'm not piling limitations or limiting beliefs on top of her i'm telling her pick what you want to do and and i'm gonna come along with you we're gonna get it done together but you can do it and so i do this and what happens is they get the identity it's over and over again tell my sons you're stronger than you ever know don't everybody take whatever you set your mind to you can do it you have a responsibility to be strong you got a responsibility to exercise every ounce of your potential you have a responsibility to be bold and stand out there and live nobody should suppress you you don't owe yourself to anybody who can't pour into you and i tell my sons that but with my daughters i can remember my she's 30 31 now uh and um uh, when she was in the ninth grade and this time I'm functioning as a single father. So I got the kids, a bunch of teenagers, had a bunch of high schoolers in the house. The, the, that first wave were going, going through high school. And I remember my sister saying, I think that, uh, I'm not going to say her name, but I think she, she might be gay. And I'm like, why do you think that? You know, so you're not worried about it. So why do you think that? She says, She's at that age where little girls go crazy over little boys, and I never hear her talking about boys. You know, she just moves around. She's real laid back. I say, well, why don't you ask her? I'm pretty sure if you ask her, she'll talk to you. Talk, you know, she'll talk to you. And when my sister asked her, she told me, she said, I like boys. I want a boyfriend. She said, but I haven't met anybody like daddy yet. Mm. She's been married now for eight or nine years. My oldest has been married for 15 years. Both of them married their first. Hmm. I'm not saying it always works out, but what I'm saying is that when you pour into a child, when you give them the values, interests, and principles by which they live, they understand it and they see it and they know that, hey, number one is they expect it. Plus, they know I can't just bring any around, anybody around my daddy. But see, when daddy's not around, so what happened is they disrupted the family. So if we're going to ever fix this, gets back to the question, we're going to have to rebuild the family. And that's not going to be an overnight thing. There's a common thing that I say often, uh, and it's real simple, and I believe it to be true. In order for us to ever really, truly become an empowered people in this country, we're going to have to have men who are willing to plant seeds that they might not be, they might not live long enough to see come to fruition. See, we live in a world where everybody wants immediate gratification. Everybody wants a pat on the back for what they've done. They want everybody to know what they did. So everybody's looking for Band-Aids. Everybody's looking for quick fixes. And the problem is you don't undo 246 years of slavery, 12 years of uh, Reconstruction, 20 years of Black codes, 70 years of Jim Crow segregation, another 50 years of mass incarceration and miseducation by sitting up, coming up with some quick fix in two years. It's not going to happen. You're going to have to literally isolate a generation. That's why I do Black Men Lead and my wife does Restoring Ghettos Forgotten Daughters. You have to isolate a generation where you train them on who they really are. And like literally, I have a, a, a sister. She's not a real sister, but she's a sister that I work with who's in the Indian, Indianapolis area. She owns a compound where she's done. She's raised eight children. And I remember having a conversation with her and she said her children were old enough to talk and reason and have conversation before they ever saw their saw a white person for the first time. She homeschooled all of her children. She literally isolated them from anything not black and not about what they were trying to teach their kids, her and her husband at the time, they're no longer married, but they still co-parent their adult children. They still work together. They're still, he's still present. Matter of fact, she had a building collapse on our compound. He's over there every day helping to fix it. Uh, that's the relation they have. Um, and anyway, she was talking about the fact that she literally can remember the day her oldest daughter saw a white person, white person for the first time. And that sounds extreme, but then you look at it. And another thing she did that I thought was really powerful is in homeschooling, when they get to where they're uh, at the 12th grade year, in order to graduate from her school, her kids had to start and run a business successfully for a year before they could graduate. Wow. 
Her <laughs> son owns his own. He's 21 and he owns his own construction contracting company. Each one of them are doing their own things, you know, and they're still kids. They do go out and whatever. But uh, one, when she finally went off to college, her friends came back around and they were talking to her mom and they were just like laugh. They thought it was the funniest thing in the world. She was embarrassed by it because she felt she feels like she's missed a lot. But her friends were like really excited by the fact that she was in her 20s and she was eating a hamburger for the first time. But yeah, man, you know, it's but, all relative though, right, Doc? Like, I mean, all that stuff is relative. You're rearing who you're around, the type of adult you're around, your geographical area, your social economic. But see, you know, that's that, the thing. We've got to stop making the basic principles and values that held us strong at one particular point in our history be relevant. I mean, uh, be relative. Uh, there has to be a universal idea of who we are. So that we know what we're measuring ourselves against. That's what Black Men Lead is. It's a rite of passage initiative that is meant to be put in front of all young Black boys and said, this is what it requires to be a man. And this is the process you're going to go through. through it. All Jews do it, regardless of what type of Jew they are. They all go through the same process. And when the boy turns 13, he has a bar mitzvah that says he has successfully completed his training to become a man. And now he starts to walk into his manhood, taking incremental steps and in becoming along the way. Every group has some form of that except us. So you can't be relative because one person thinks this is what a man is. And you can see it in the arguments. I was talking about the, you can see it in the arguments, the discussion of what a, what, what a man is. You know, can he do this? Can he pay all the bills or can he do this? Can he do, you know, whatever, whatever. You know, everybody's got an idea, but nobody really knows because nobody has ever had a universal uh, uh, standard set to say, OK, this is what it is to be a man, you know, because it should, it should be a number of things. That, that are obvious. And then there's some other things that we can sit up and we can look at. But, um, you know, the number one principle in black man lead is a black man never causes harm to a black woman. Emotionally, psychologically, physically, at no time, at no point does a black man ever cause harm to a black woman. Then we go down, we talk about the responsibility of owning your own business. That's, that's, not, a, that's not a notion. That's not a dream. That's not an idea. That's a responsibility. You can't build power if you're giving yourself. You can't leave your kids a legacy if you're on a job. I don't care how much your job pays you. When you die, your kid doesn't get the job. The next nope. person in line does. How can you pass down wealth? I don't care how much you make. You got to have something to pass your kid. You got to have something with your name on it that you can transfer and put their name on it, and now it's theirs. That's got to be built. But what, what, what I had to say is this. You have to isolate them long enough to put it in them in a way that it can't be snatched out. But if you sit up and you put it in them and then at five years old, you send them to a public school, it's snatched out within six months because they're going to be inundated with a whole new idea of who they are. They're going to catch an inferiority complex because everything is going to be built around a Eurocentric idea of what is. And so that's what we're up against is literally isolating a generation long enough to empower them to where they don't succumb to the suggestions of a white supremacist society that will have them thinking that I need to fit in, that I need to act more like this. I need to wear my hair like this. I need to, you know, their Eurocentric idea of what's classy, what's professional, what's beautiful. Uh, and then you got to go fit in their system. You're never going to be as strong in their system as they are. It's theirs. So you got to own something strong enough that their system respects your system. And now they're forced to operate and, 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 and operate with you and work with you. But you're never going to get any political clout holding up a sign. You're never going to get any political clout sitting up yelling and screaming. Why? Because it's just like my three-year-old grandson. He has absolutely no power, no force in this house. He can't make anybody do anything. And throwing a tantrum means absolutely nothing to me because there's nothing he can do to me. If I don't do what I do, what he wants to do. So anything I do for him is because I want to. Well, he's my grandson. So, yeah, I, I want to do it. I love him. I, you know, he, he, he gets pretty much what he wants to, but not because he has the power to. Now, the flip side is, so if he throws a tantrum, that's all it is, is a tantrum. However, 
The same thing happens with black folks. You grab a whole bunch of signs, thousands of you go down there. All you got is a big collective temper tantrum. Why? Because there's nothing you can do to them if they don't give you what you want. Yeah. You got to have economic power to underwrite your protest. Because the economic power and the natural training and the development of it all says if you don't give us something, we mad. We, uh, we hear with our signs and let you know we mad. But what follows is if you don't give us what we want, we are going to X, Y, Z. We're going to take our economic power and we're going to endorse this. We're going to take our economic power. What if it, say, for instance, it's, it's a business and they're not serving you right. We're going to take our economic power and we're going to put a store up here just like this next to yours and we're going to compete with you. Now, you either give us what you want or we're going to put you out of business. And that's how things go all the way down the road. If you don't have money, you can't lobby. You can't lobby. You ain't got jack going on in the political arena. Yeah. So it's hard, all to, of these hard things, to have power. Yeah. It's hard to have power, no money. Yeah. So, you know, that's just the, the, the surface of what we're facing. That's the surface of what we're facing. And, you know, we talk about incest. We talk about inbreeding. We talk about uh the lack of protection of our women we talk about um being last on the uh socio the we on the last rung of the socioeconomic ladder everybody's ahead of us and we don't understand why it's because they easily distract us they e easily mislead us and take us down paths uh that don't are not conducive to our growth and our empowerment we are easily misled and that's the problem because we don't have a standard. We don't have a that, that again, we're back to the values, the interests, and the principles. We don't have a consistent idea of what we should have and what we should be doing. Yeah. And I know, I know you gotta go, Doc, but you gotta come back, Doc. That's, that's a lot more stuff I want to ask you and talk about with you. Um, everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace, y'all need to get down there. Um Check out this. He's written, I think you've written about 30 books, right, Doc? I think the you uh, up to 30 uh, now, right? Well, the way I qualify, <laughs> the, way, the way I qualify or categorize books is bo a book has to be over 200 pages for me to be classified as a book. So uh with that, I've written 24. I'm on my 25th, but I've written a lot of scholarly papers, uh, a couple of dissertations. Uh, I've written uh, what I call guides, which are literally books, but they're 150 pages or less. Uh, so if, if you're talking about publications alone, somewhere about 45 or 50, uh, you're yeah. talking about academic articles, hundreds of academic articles and thousands of prose articles uh, in publications in a number of different places uh, across the Internet in actual publications and news articles, magazines, things of that nature. Uh, you know, this has been my work for the past 30 years. Okay. Well, let everybody know uh, where they can find you, Doc, um, so they can get on down there and check you out. I put that piece of work um, that we were talking about earlier, uh, uh -huh. molestation, incest, and rape in the African-American families. I put the link in the chat, folks. Go ahead, check it out, because if you pull that up, you probably can get your hands on some of the other good doctor stuff as well. So go ahead, check that out. It's not a long read. I think it's only about 15 pages. It ain't that much out of your life. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't, it shouldn't take that long at all. Um, and I'll be following that work up with a more extensive work probably within the next year uh, because it's becoming more prevalent. I'm also going to be dealing with mental health in general uh, in my work in the coming year. But you can find me on YouTube at The Black Voice. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at uh, uh, Rick Wallace. Uh, it may be Bishop Rick Wallace or something like that because the Facebook page has been up forever. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Rick Wallace 21. You can find me on Instagram at Rick Wallace 21. All right. Y'all get down there, man, and check the good doctor out. Um, Dr. Wallace, I appreciate you coming through, brother. Um, I know this was short notice. I kind of came out of nowhere. But um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you yeah. you was like, all right, man, and I appreciate it, Doc. And you got to come back, man. Lot all right, we'll definitely ask. work out something. Uh, I was able to work it out with my wife. When I got off with you, when I told you I was going to check it out, I said, hey, look, uh, this guy's talking about something real that we both, and uh, I can say this about my wife because my wife has written her own book about her experiences, but she's a survivor. 
Uh, matter of fact, that's how I met her. Uh, okay. She came to me and we worked together for a while. Uh, she went her way. I went my way. We came back together and I knew that's who I wanted to be with. So uh, we made it happen. But uh, I was telling my wife what it's about. Once I told her what it was about, she was like, hey, yeah, go ahead. Uh, do your thing. Uh, you got an hour. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm going a little over. Uh, well, tell her, tell her I appreciate her allowing you to, you know, come up here and, you know, right. chop it up with us for a little while. Right. But you got to come back, Doc. You got to yeah. come back. You know, maybe point. maybe when I come back, I'll bring her because I think she brings a, a very powerful voice uh, for the people who have suffered through this. Um, and her story is magnificent. Uh, you know, you know, I, I, I think so highly of her because she could have easily been defeated. She could have easily have been one of those people who we, t we were talking about who never recovered and she she fought and she healed and she became and she did and she's done so much. I'm so proud of her. And uh, she has words for women who've gone through that. I mean, she has a healing word and it's unique and it's authentic. And I, I w would love for her to share that. So maybe we can get her on. She did, she's, she's not the, as camera friendly as I am. She's not as drawn to it. I've been doing it all my life, but I can I, I, every now and then I can urge her to get on there. She, you know, she does videos herself, but uh, I look forward to it. So absolutely, let's get together uh, so, sometime in the future and come back and, and finish this discussion and maybe uh, expand and elaborate on some other things. Absolutely, man. I'm looking forward to it, man. And um, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to wifey coming on. I mean, you got me. I had to write this down now. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. And sometime in the future, Doc, you can come on back. You and Wifey, man, we'll have a good long sit down, man, and maybe the people will benefit from it. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dr. Rick. Walsh.